So, wow, thank you everyone. I see we have uh, 12 people on the call and uh, I'm sure we'll have more coming, but I want to welcome those who have already joined. Uh, let's do a good view, gallery is good. Okay, good. Yeah, I see Delila, I see John, I see Joseph, I see Barbara. Barbara, we already talked. I see Jonathan, Megan, Sarah. Welcome, we were working here on some issues with technology, but we're good. Please feel welcome. We will have like two more minutes and then we can begin. Happy to see you, Brian, and happy to see everyone here. And uh, thank you also, Fifi, for being here as well. Brian, I'm sure you can hear us, right? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Wonderful. Good. I think what we're going to do, because uh, other, some of us are joining from um, uh, international places where it could be late, very late, actually. It's uh, good to go ahead and begin. First, I want to introduce myself. My name is Damaris Choti. I work here at Michigan State University with the African Studies Center, and I coordinate student and alumni programs. I want to welcome again everybody that has joined us today. Uh, maybe we can meet ourselves. I, um, please, let's ev everybody mute themselves. Sonti, if you can mute yourself, please. Yeah, I want to welcome everybody to this Tea Time. This is the first one this semester, but Tea Time is one of the African Studies Center's signature event that we hold bi-weekly. And uh, the, the, the forum, it's actually aimed at sharing knowledge about Africa, learning about different aspects of Africa. I, I tend to uh, look at Iron Af or not Iron Africa, sorry, uh, the African Tea Time as a space or forum that brings Africa to the world or takes MSU out, not necessarily to Africa, but to, to the world as well. So um, I'm glad to be here. New members that are joining us for the first time, please feel welcome. Uh, the old members that have been to Tea Time, I welcome you as well. So today's talk is going to focus on um, two countries in Africa, and that is Kenya and Lesotho. And uh, I'm very, very, very pleased and happy to have two wonderful speakers, and that's uh, Brian and Fifi. Brian and Fifi were part of the Mandela Washington Fellowship this past summer here at Michigan State University, and uh, Mandela Washington Fellowship is a U.S. Department of State funded program that brings young African leaders from Africa, uh, from different uh, parts of uh, the continent, about 700 young people every year to different institutions in the US and Michigan State University is one of the uh, institutions that uh, hosts the program. And that's where I happened to meet Brian and Fifi for the first time last year and when I Definitely, even after the program ended, I knew that they were coming back to Michigan State University to share about their work uh, that they're, they're doing within their communities and their countries. So Brian and Fifi will introduce themselves more. At tea time, we don't do elaborate uh, introductions. Uh, I'll just mention who they are. Our first presenter will be Brian. And Brian Mshiri is uh, coming from Kenya, as I said, and is a writer, activist, and advocate of the disability community in Kenya. He is founder of Strong Spine Foundation, which seeks to empower disabled people through advocacy and awareness. And he is the author of a weekly series that is called From Stairs to Ramps on Potentash blog. And Brian, please, when your time comes, feel free to introduce yourself more. As I said, Brian uh, is from Kenya. Our second speaker will be Fifi. Fifi, please, when your time comes, uh, give us your full name. Fifi, Fifi has a longer name, but she goes by Fifi. And she's a social worker, a Canon Collins Scholar, Mandela Washington alumna, Yali uh, RL, RLCSA alumna, Vodacom Lesotho Foundation Insight Center Coordinator, Founder and Secretary General of unique voices. That's the brief introduction. I know they have longer profiles than what I've shared, 
but I let them um when they 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 uh, go on to give us the the presentation. Please uh, feel free to tell us more about yourself. I'll give this opportunity to Brian. And again, thank you so much for joining us today to share about the advocacy work that you uh, you do in your countries. And we're really look, looking forward to it. But I need to mention that uh, we are going to have both presentations first. We have Brian present, and then uh, we go ahead and have uh, Fifi present as well. And then we can have a discussion. Please, we hope you can stay with us until the end to be able to engage with us because Brian. Thank you so much, Damaris, for the opportunity to to be back to be back in MSU in one way or another, and to be here alongside Fifi too. So thank you, and thank you to everybody who has tuned in. Um, as I begin my as I begin my 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 presentation, maybe I would share my screen. Is that possible? Yes. Let me give you the co-host. Yes, are you do? You see a prompt on, on your screen, Brian? Um, okay, yeah, yeah, I see oh. it. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so just go ahead and... Maybe if you can make it full screen or it's already yeah, full screen. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure, great. Okay. So, okay, hello everybody once again. So my name is Brian Mushiri Wahenya. As Dama stated, I come from Kenya and um, I am a writer and I'm a disability advocate. And during the summer, I was I had the pleasure to be one of the 2020, 20, 23, uh, 24 fellows to, to be at MSU for the six week intense um, fellowship program. So my my the title the title of my presentation today will be exploring advocacy in the context of disability in kenya and uh, what i what you should expect uh, through this presentation is just me my thoughts and you you'll get an opportunity to know me better to know what i do and and uh, the goals that i have for my from my foundation or non-profit. And I'm, I'm going to start with a brief um, exp, um, a brief uh, ideation of what I, I think advocacy is in my context. And for me, advocacy or disability advocacy uh, means speaking up against, speaking loud and proud for a cause that one is most passionate about. And for me, in this case, I'm very passionate about disability issues. Being a disabled person myself, I, I have very strong uh, thoughts and feelings about the lives that we get to live, especially here in our country of Kenya. And I, earn, and I, I have this strong yearning to just make life very easier and better for people who are in my community. Um, when I think about disability, I think about it in three, in three different aspects and one is self advocacy systemic advocacy and and community advocacy so i feel like you can't have one without the other and all three work together in different aspects um, in different aspects or respects in whatever aspect you are talking about i think they all work together to uh, create a very um, a stronger result and a much more uh, effective effective change i also believe that advocacy should be very collaborative um, i have had experience with people in the past who 
who are very passionate about advocating for a certain issue that it becomes almost divisive that you they you you almost feel like it's you're always negative you're always complaining about something but that is not the approach that i want to take in my advocacy work i want to to be more collaborative and take take it as an opportunity to educate and create awareness rather than it being uh, uh, a a topic of a topic of divisiveness so that being said i'm going to go to the next slide which is me and yeah that's me that's uh, me on my wheelchair i'm going to be talking about i'm going to be talking more about why i'm uh, how i got to be on a wheelchair and how that has impacted my life but i had a small note here as an uh, as an active disability advocate with a passion for fostering inclusion within the disability community brian moshiri seeks to create a more accessible inclusive and empowering society so that is where my passion lies just creating an, a more an accessible inclusive and empowering uh, society and community for all the 1 million disabled people here in kenya so it's a it's a uh, it's an ambitious thing to say but it's something that i think very highly of and i'm very passionate about so this talk or this presentation in this presentation i will be talking about my personal journey my introduction to advocacy launching the strong spine foundation which is my non-profit i will be i'll be investigating or exploring right to education as it pertains to to disability i'll be talking i'll be also exploring advocate advocating for access to public space to public spaces and lastly equity in the workplace so that is what i'll be presenting on today okay uh who am i and why uh, how did i come to to acquire a disability so I felt like in order to pass this message as effectively as possible, maybe I would use some images of myself. So uh, on your screen are three images about who I was before the, the, the accident, who I was, what, what happened to me and how I responded. Uh, recently, I've been thinking about this powerful quote that you don't have control over what happens to you, but you have all the control over how you're going to respond to what happens to you. And I feel like that has been my mantra, especially in the last couple of years, just trying to respond effectively and trying to change the narrative of my life and not uh, bowing down to what happened to me. So this first picture of me in a white shirt uh, was taken uh, maybe five months before the accident happened. So what happened was, uh, 10 years ago, actually in one month, I'll be commemorating 10 years since since the accident happened. Um, I suffered a C5, C7, C5, C7 injury, which in layman's terms means I, I broke my spine very high up and I lost function of my upper limbs and I have very limited function of my upper limbs and zero uh, function of my lower limbs. So... The second picture is a picture of my dad holding my head and that was uh, because I couldn't even support my head at the time. Uh, I was in hospital and I was reeling from the injury. It was, uh, it was taking a toll on me, on my family, but I'm so glad that we are all able to get from, to, to move forward and um, persevere from that very difficult situation. The last picture is my favorite. That, that, that is the picture that uh, I took, I think, on the first day of arriving uh, at MSU. That picture was taken in front of the Broad Museum when I, where I was uh, surrounded by my fellows. It was my first time leaving the country. It was my first time being on a plane. And I feel like it, it was just a full circle moment for me, you know, uh, having gone through such a trying moment and, and uh, do, starting something and my efforts being noticed and them getting me to, to all the way to the US than 13,000 kilometers away from home. So I'm very proud of uh, of the fact that I was able to make the trip there and uh, meet all you 
wonderful people who are, who I may uh, who are now I, I I now regard as friends. So, okay, the next slide is my early interests in disability advocacy. So this is based on of my own personal experiences and these are the things these three things are maybe what i would call uh, my turning points and why and how why and how i came to think of myself as an advocate because these are the things that affected me on a personal level so number one was inaccessibility to assistive devices i i felt this immediately after after I left, I left hospital because it was so hard for me and my family to to get a, a wheelchair that was appropriate for me. You know, I had experienced a very a severe injury, spinal cord injury, and my body was still adjusting to everything. And I needed a very special wheelchair, but I could not get it because in my hometown of Nakuru, I come from a from a town called Nakuru, which is like four hours away from from the capital capital from the capital Nairobi so i realized that i couldn't even access something as basic as a wheelchair i had to i had to to wait i think i i waited for a month for it to arrive because i needed a wheelchair that had a headrest but those that, the ones that were available didn't have so i had to really to order specifically and yes, that opened my eyes. I wondered what do other people do if I'm struggling this much? Then, what what what? Uh, how how is it for other people? And that also applied to uh, adult diapers, which were so expensive. Other things like uh, sitting cushions, which I couldn't even get. And even actually, it took three years for me to get a motorized wheelchair, which has which ended up changing my life because that is what I needed most because I don't have use over my upper limbs. The, the second thing is lack of physical access to public spaces. So before the accident, I was very oblivious about accessibility for people who had wheelchair, who are wheelchair users again because I was not in that community because uh, I didn't know anyone who I, I make this joke I say I'm the first I'm the first disabled person I ever met because prior to me I had not met anyone with a disability so I was my first my first encounter so you can imagine all these things were just coming in uh, thick and fast and I, I had to learn uh, in double speed so when it comes to the issue of accessibility, that was something that was a real shock to me because on one uh, when, on one one minute I could go anywhere I wanted, but on the next in the next minute there were places that were very inaccessible for me. So that really opened my eyes as to what my life was going to be. The third thing was um, lack of accurate awareness about the disability community. I used the term. I use the word accurate awareness because I, I I realized very fast that there was a narrative that was being told about disabled people, especially by the mainstream media here in Kenya. We were portrayed a, a certain way, in a certain way that every time that there was a there was a story being aired about a person with a disability, they would say they would use words like dreams were shattered, their life had ended nothing was to become of them henceforth and i really felt bad about it because i got injured when i was 19 and uh when you are 19 and someone starts telling you that it's uh, your dreams have shattered and uh, there is no future for you I, I i took it personally and i wanted to change that narrative so in total these three things i would say were the turning points for me and i i knew what i, I needed to do and then I knew what the next step uh, needed to be. And the next step for me was creating a non-profit or just starting my advocacy journey. And the platform that I, would, uh, that I was going to use to do that was StrongSpine. StrongSpine was uh, StrongSpine. Here in Kenya, we call them foundations, but in the US, you would better, uh, they are, they are, 
you'd know them more as a non-profit. So I established it in 2018 and I had a dream that I wanted to foster or advocate for inclusion, equity and awareness. These are the three pillars that I wanted to work on and the first thing that I did when I when I launched, when I, when I registered it, I said I'm going to start with what I have. I'm not going to, to be too ambitious that I want to apply for grants for millions and millions of dollars because I, I, I come from a village, I'm a village boy and I didn't have a lot to, to, to start with. So what I did was I had two wheelchairs. So I took my spare wheelchair, the first wheelchair that I had, it was a manual wheelchair, and I said, I'm going to donate this wheelchair and it's going to be my first, my first kind of um, project. So I went to our national host, to our provincial hospital here in Nakuru County, and I, I walked in into the trauma, into the trauma ward, and I, to, and I talked, and I had a conversation with the doctor, and I asked him, who needs this wheelchair? Who needs the wheelchair most based on, based on your assessment? And he pointed me to someone, and I don't. I, that was my first donation, and from there everything went on really well. So uh, on the side here are some of the milestones that I would say I've had with Strong Spine so far. The first one is leading the first accessibility assessment in my hometown. So there wasn't any study or any um, specific way to assess uh, the, the state of um, accessibility in my town. So what I did is my friends and I, we went around, we um, major public spaces like banks, uh, malls, schools, restaurants, and we made a, a detailed report about the state of accessibility and using this data I was able to take it to to the to people who could make changes in our in our county and uh, I was able to have conversations with them and tell them the importance of it and the importance of having paved uh, pavements that were accessible in but the importance of having ramps the importance of lifts where it was possible the importance of accessible uh, public transport i told them about everything so uh, and you can see the second point there is push for legislative reforms in the town's accessibility provisions and i feel like we were able to make uh, progress in that because two years ago uh, my my town my my town my hometown underwent uh, like underwent um uh, uh maybe they 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 did uh they, they refurbished if i could use that word they refurbished everything and the pavements are now accessible and much of the town is reasonably accessible you can get from one place to the next the next uh, milestone is to this we have been we have been able to facilitate the donation of a, of over 20 wheelchairs and for us this is so important because the 20 wheelchairs have been specialized and unique wheelchairs are, are specific, uh, which are specific for specific people. So they have not been wheelchairs that have just come from the shop and given to people. They have been wheelchairs that have been uh, fitted and measured for, for individuals, which means a lot to me, which goes back to the aspect of equity. And the last uh, point here is start, uh, started an adult diaper campaign that donated adult diapers to over 200 disabled people. This was uh, one of my proudest moments because adult diapers is, uh, is still a taboo thing to talk about here in Kenya because people are not yet um, uh, ready to have the conversation that people really need or really use adult diapers out here because you know there's that uh, uh, people don't want to talk about incontinence and they still think that that is not something that uh, we that is something too personal that we are not supposed to be talking about but we were able to have that conversation and to raise a lot of money and to achieve that fit which i'm again i'm very proud of <clears throat> so inclusive education i was first um i was first in introduced to the, the concept of inclusive education uh, in 2019 where uh, a teacher called me and told me about 
this case that she had about a woman her, uh, uh, a young a young a young girl her name was Ida and she didn't have a wheelchair to to go to school so so she was missing class she she was behind in class she was behind in all the exams so I went to see her and it it sparked this uh, this this thought in my mind that I wanted to to understand how what is inclusive education and for me I thought I'd always thought that inclusive education is where you take uh, students who have disabilities and able-bodied students you put them together they can learn from each other they can share and they can educate each other that was my idea I upon doing my research I realized that there are there are 337 uh, special needs school in Kenya but the way they understand inclusive education is very different because what they have is special uh, disabled uh, uh, students with disabilities are put on to the side the, the, spe the special needs school are put uh, by themselves so the the, 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 the the there is no integration between for the most part there is no there is no integration between the the, the students with disabilities and the able bodies so they are put apart in different schools and i feel like that is not how it's supposed to be I could I can imagine that there is reasoning behind that uh, to make it uh, possible for them to have special um, special curriculum and for, to cater for their special needs but still I felt like inclus if you are going to be inclusive let us go all the way and I've been trying to champion for that for schools to be more integrated to have even if you are not. They are, we are going to have separate classes, but let them um, coexist as one in the same school. I think that is possible. So that is something that I've been passionate again, passionate about doing. So the problem faced in the education system, public education system here in Kenya, is that this lack of enough teachers who have been trained specifically to teach. Children with disability, to children with disabilities, what you find is that because because uh, there they haven't been systems in the past to address this issue, and now is when um, we are we are we are slowly starting to catch up. Now teachers who are not trained specifically to 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 deal with the children with disabilities are being are being given that role and you see uh, you find that they are not giving them the need the care or the the attention that they need because they are not well trained because you will find that maybe in an entire school only two teachers are trained to to deal with the children with di children with disabilities and i felt like that is unacceptable and we need to catch up and we need to do better the second problem we face is low student turnout in school because again we are still trying to to add, to to emphasize and to create awareness of the importance of these children being brought, being not being kept home because that has been the narrative for for many years that disabled children don't get the opportunity to go to school so we are trying to uh, get this word out that it is important for you for, for you to bring your, your child with cerebral palsy, with autism, bring them to school and let them get an education, let them socialize and let them know that they can have bright futures and they can be educated individuals. And the last uh, problem that I saw is discrimination against more severe disabilities. It is easy to have a child who has a mild disability and this was a study that I, I found on the internet that even teachers preferred teachers and school alike preferred to have a certain kind of this uh, spectrum of disability that is not too severe that would will not require too much attention and for me uh, I felt like that was discrimination because if you're going to to choose who you are going to to have in your school or who is going to get an education an education then what is the point of it all if you're going to be inclusive let us go there let us 
go the 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 entire way i feel like that is that is the right way to do to do it to to go about inclusion the next point here is accessibility in public spaces and i wanted to include this slide here especially because of my experience in the in the states like i said i have grown up in in the village and here uh, i wouldn't say access i would rate access as 10 percent 10 percent of what is around me is accessible there's only so much i can do there's only so so many places i can go but the moment i got to the us i was opened up to a new life and all these possibilities for the first time in in 10 years i was i was independent from the time that i, I left the 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 my hostel in the morning to the time that i went back in the evening i didn't need help or assistance to do anything or to go anywhere i i i was i was opened up to the fact that i could be independent as a disabled person and this is a concept that i was not aware i didn't know could exist and this went this realization even went further when i when i started when i went when i went outside uh msu and started touring other other places in the us and i realized just how committed the government is to making every every place as accessible as possible to to the to say to the wheelchair users in my case in kenya less than 50 percent of our public spaces are accessible to the disabled to disabled people you will remember i mentioned that we did uh, an assessment in my hometown and that that is very uh, apt to the findings that i found uh, when I did that assessment and I found that it's very hard uh, that is that is why you will find most people with disabilities prefer to stay at home and not to 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 stress themselves because first you'll have to think about uh, logistics because we don't have public transport at all accessible public transport at all so it's very expensive in the first place to even leave your house the moment you wake up you 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 think about going outside your house it's you have to think about money and as you will see in, in my next slide is that we constitute the biggest uh, unemployed minority here in kenya the disability community so you have no money and you have no means to to go to to do to even run your errands so you prefer just to stay back at home and maybe yeah people say you need to, to go out more but how will you go out if if the environment is not friendly for you so yeah so i'm very also very passionate about this as you had damaris mention i start i i i, I write a column called from stairs to ramps on on an online blog which I, I specifically talk about issues of accessibility and why it is important for us, even as a from a personal level in your house, to just make sure that you have a, an accessible environment. You, you know, um, it's going to be beneficial not only to wheelchair users or to disabled people, but you never know. Even for you, as you age, you might you might um, be you might uh, experience a disability. You might. Um, suffer a small accident that will need you to to use maybe a wheelchair and those uh, accessible uh, uh, accessible spaces are going to come in in handy a lot so <clears throat> equity in the workplace this is my last slide disabled people are the biggest unemployed minority less than 20 percent of the 1 million uh, 1 million recorded disabled people in Kenya uh, have um, have a salary so you ask yourself how are every how is everybody else surviving so I found that from my own research I found that the way they are, these other people these other disabled people survive is through uh, well wishers well wishers and donations uh, from friends and family 
So that is no way to live because the, the opportunities are there, but the, the, there is no access. The, the opportunities are there, but there is so many, so many hindrances that are between us and the opportunities. And these hindrances are things like accessible working environments that are disabled, that are disability friendly, going back to the issue of accessibility, equal pay and equal opportunities for promotions and incentives. You might get an opportunity for employment as a disabled person, but you are going to have so much put against you that you, you are going to be paid less than, than uh, the other people. Your opportunities to for growth and 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 for promotions are going to be very minimal as compared to other uh, you are uh, your co-workers and this is this is this is this is telling of the societal um, uh, how society views disability that we are not uh, productive we are not uh, capable and that is not true these are the issues that we are continuously trying to stereotypes that we are trying to debunk and trying to educate people that this is not how it's supposed to be the last one is merit should be based on capabilities of individual as opposed to fulfilling uh, inclusion and diversity I, I i understand that that might feel like um uh, like a confusing statement but you see because of the pressure that is exerted on companies to to have like uh, to be inclusive of disabled people, you find that companies tend to to employ disabled people just to check boxes, and I feel like that is not how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to be put there because of merit. You're supposed to be put there because you're capable, and you're not supposed to be um, a charity case, which is the case. For, for some people, for some companies, they just want to, to put it there that, yeah, we are inclusive, we even have this disabled person here, but uh, that is counterproductive. We want, if, you are going, if disabled people are going to, to have employment, let them get the opportunity because they deserve it and they worked for it and they earned it. So I, I don't know, I don't know if I've talked too much, but Thank you so much for for your for the opportunity to to present for you to present to you, and uh, I'm going to end my presentation with a quote from a disability and a fellow disability advocate. And the quote says, "Silence is the last thing in the world. Silence is the last is the is the last thing the world would ever hear from me." So in my mind. Advocacy is speaking out, speaking loud, speaking proud about the things that I am most passionate about. And I've just shown you the things that I am most passionate about. And moving forward, we have so many we have so many projects in 2024 that we want to do. And um, yeah, I hope I have educated you about uh, what happens in Kenya. It's not all gloomy, but I wanted to really highlight the issues. So thank you so much, Damaris. Thank you so much, Brian. Please feel free to um, unshare the screen. Thank you really so much for that very powerful presentation. I know there, there might be questions, there might be comments. I see some on the screen, but I want to give uh, the second presenter, Fifi, an opportunity to speak, and then we can open it up for discussion, comments, questions, and all. So Fifi, please. Fifi, can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can hear you. Thank you oh. so much, Damaris. Please go thank ahead, you so Fifi. OK, thank you so much. Greetings to everyone. Uh, who has been able to join us in for today. My name in full is Refilo Hape Sisimi, and Refilo Hape simply translates to we have been given again because I am a third girl and the last one after two girls. And um, preferably I go with Fifi 
because maybe that is how normally people around me close to my heart normally call me. And also since Fifi is very inclusive, um, it's accommodative to everyone, including children and people who cannot speak to so to or find it difficult to say my long name. So um, I come from the beautiful mountain kingdom of Lesotho. And Lesotho is a small mountainous country entirely landlocked within uh, South Africa. And one thing that has helped me of being a Lesotho, okay, um, please, oh, before I continue much, um, I believe, um, I first have to apologize for not being able to share a video. I know it might be um, worrisome or because to people particularly who have sight because they are more used to using a uh, sight and seeing. Uh, but um, because of technology challenges of which I believe uh, people will be able to understand more as I continue with the presentation, please bear with me. And just for today, have a moment um, in the shoes of uh, visually impaired individuals and another thing is um, to everyone during the Q&A uh, kindly uh, questions that will be addressed to me may they be voiced out and please the merits assist because it will be a little bit challenging to go through the chat box so I was saying I come from the mountain kingdom and one thing I love about Lesotho is that we have various clans and in different lands, we identify with different um, animals within uh, the, that, that are there in the world. And I come from Badaunt land, where we identify with the lion. So I normally call myself the lioness. And the lion philosophy is the one that has helped me throughout and to finally be where I am. Professionally, I am a social worker. And... I am also a gender and disability rights advocate. My journey within the disability inclusion activism is greatly influenced by my life lived experiences. I was not born blind, but when I was 12, I had eye problems. When I went to the eye doctor, they told me that um, I had a retinal detachment and they suspected I might have had an accident. That was in January 2005. And they could notice a clot on my optic nerve. And they asked me whether there was any accident. The only thing I could recall closer to that event was um, in December 2004. I had, you know, sibling fight, which is very normal, which often happens in many families. But during that sibling fight, as we normally fought with one of my sisters, I had a nosebleed and they suspected that was the problem. But my journey, but my journey as uh, a visually impaired some individual, not just that I didn't just suddenly come to totally blind. It was a journey and I had to adjust a number of things. But I finally got totally blind in 2012, although I was declared visually impaired in 2008. So for me, it was such a challenge because I had to, to change the way I do things. I remember while I was still in high school, one of the things that I loved most was STEM-related subjects, and my teachers knew I would always be among the top five. But being visually impaired in Lesotho, it meant I had to give up on that because there was a lack of assistive devices and there were lack of audio books, even real books, including specialized teachers who could assist in that particular schools. And everything was, you know, a sudden change because even studying as somebody who's visually impaired, it meant I had to depend on other students to read for me since there were no books. And sometimes there were not ones. And at some point I even had to bribe them to read for me. And since the journey of being visually impaired, it didn't, it came with stages. At some point in 2011, I went to a rehabilitation center where I was taught in mobility and some of mobility and orientation and how I can cope and manage as a visually impaired. But by then I was still partially blind. And so most of the things were not 
synced pretty well. So when I became totally blind, it meant I had to also start from scratch. But unfortunately, since we have one center that does that, and we totally depend that depend on that center as the entire visually impaired population in Lesotho. So we only have one opportunity to go to the center. So it meant I could not go there. I had to struggle, try to figure out how I navigate, and it meant I really had to rely and depend on other people. So that on itself really changed how I look at things, and it made me see the world in different ways. I feel very honored uh, today to be invited to come and talk about this topic relating to available support systems and empower, uh, empowerment and support system available within Lesotho for disabled community. This topic is very close to my heart because persons with disabilities in Lesotho are faced with multiple challenges. And that I learned since I was growing up. I was born in a visually impaired family. All of my family members are visually impaired. My father was totally blind, my mom partially, and my two sisters, the other totally blind and the other partially blind. So I grew up seeing all the challenges that they were facing. And since I was not born blind, my parents had that strong belief and I was the support system since I was very young. And I realized the struggles that they were facing with. We had to fight to, to, fight to have many things because I remember one of the challenges that we had to face was after my father passed away, uh, we had the families, relatives, and the community members sold our home simply because we were girls at home and they believed we could not inherit anything, including land. They took all the property. So we had to fight for everything. And what happened is deeply rooted in cultural beliefs and stereotypes towards disability and also towards how Basutu view women traditionally. So before I even go any further, I believe um, it is most important to make you understand like that traditionally in Lesotho, uh, disability is believed to be a case of punishment from God. So automatically that belief consciously and unconsciously influences people to do things that put persons with disability, you know, in an awkward position, leaves them uh, within many development structures, and they literally forget or do not even see the need. Sometimes others do not even try to take the initiative because they don't understand of how they should do it. Because if you say somebody is being punished, there's no need, like, to help them. Maybe a person has been punished because there's a wrongdoing that they did. So that in itself influences how persons with disabilities are being treated. And in Lesotho, <laughs> Lesotho is a very patriarchal country. And for so long, women were not allowed to inherit anything. Uh, they were regarded as um, minors and they could not make any decisions. So I think you can have a little highlight of the challenges that are facing women with disabilities on top of generally the challenges that all the disability community is being faced with. So that in itself, they influence me to, to have a deep desire to understand matters relating to gender and social inequalities within the society. And besides um, the social work that I studied, I also undertook gender studies so that I can better understand, besides better understanding, I can become a voice to many who are voiceless. And since there are so many things that the disabled community is being faced with in Lesotho, I thought, Maybe I should just try to highlight um, one aspect of it and that I should do through my personal experiences 
as I was doing uh, my studies, particularly I would look at higher institutions of learning. So that in itself, like today we, really talk, we are talking about how persons with disabilities are being empowered and supported. Before I get deep into what literally I do now as an activist and as a leader who is very passionate about issues relating to disabilities. Uh, my journey as um, an individual, it was um, very, very challenging. I remember when I went to, I studied social work degree at the National University of Lesotho. So when I went there to continue with, to study, uh, to undertake my studies, the major challenges that I was encountering was lack of assistive devices. I still had to depend on other students to read for me. It's true there was a library within the school, but materials within the library were not accessible. Most were the cited books. Uh, there was few computers with speech readers. And still on that, I believe it is wise to highlight that since from secondary, Fifi? Fifi, can you hear me? At least to take that module in computer and also in math. And that meant I had to be struggling to teach myself how to navigate the computer to do my studies since I have to do research and stuff. And it was very challenging. There was a unit, disability unit, and in it, there was only one assistant. And we are about 15 students within the school who needed support from the center. That in itself also highlights that there was a lack of support for me as an individual, and not just me, even the students that were within the school with. And they were still faced multiple challenges and resistance as I also highlighted the issue of cultural norms and stereotypes towards disability. Some of the lecturers found it difficult or did not, it took so much effort for them to be convinced that they had to provide study materials. And that in itself, it meant it affected my work negatively and I had to be more resilient so that I can be able to become a voice of many who have not had the opportunity to go to school because in reality, many persons with disabilities find it very difficult to go to university levels because of the regulations that are expected. There are no accommodations. If they are there, like some people put it as a barrier to try to, to stop, like, you know, they say the policy says there's, there's, like looking at the National University of Lesotho, there's no specific policy on how to support persons with disabilities. So it means anyone will do a conclusion or decision based on what they think it is best. And that in itself, for me and of what we know even in the world and looking at available laws and treaties, it is disregarding their rights and in particular their right to education. So I had to study under that condition and Fortunately, with the support of my classmates, uh, I was able to go through. They would take that time to read for me, record the notes that will be dictated or uh, be written on the boards in the classroom setting of which I could not capture. And that in itself was traumatizing to me, but the support that they gave me really helped me to make it through. And as I advanced with my studies, I studied in I think uh, Fifi, Fifi. It is our neighboring country. It is true, I knew when I got to the center, Center for Gender and Africa Studies, it was that first experience 
with somebody visually impaired. Things were a bit challenging at first. And I remember at some point, I told the program director that I think I'm withdrawing. I think I'm done. I can no longer take it because I could not cope. This time around, I had to study online. And that skill that I was being denied on the basis that I could not do it because I am visually impaired was now becoming a reality that that which they thought they were preventing a problem, it was a problem in itself and I could not cope and I could not do anything even in the future. So the program director and also the department, they tried all they could and the disability unit within the, um, the university, they tried all they could, they could provide an editor and somebody who'd go through my work. But I would, have, I would like to highlight that before all those provisions were being provided, I had to depend on a friend who was also partially blind. And that meant my work on itself was not good looking because <laughs> I was doing something I taught myself. I did not know some of the basics of how I do the general formatting and editing so that my work can be presentable. But I was able finally to pass my work, uh, to pass um, that uh, decree. And it was through the support that I received. So with this story uh, that I highlight, I think you can relate of the situation of how persons with disabilities particularly the visually impaired, are being faced with. This is not just the case with the visually impaired. I also learned uh, that even those with a hearing and speech impairment are also being faced with some challenges. And the major challenges are with regard to um, STEM-related subjects for, for, for the hearing. It also becomes a problem when it comes to language uh, subjects. So it means if now we are talking about what the country itself is doing or individuals within different structures and system, systems, if um, they are not being more intentional as individuals, it, it is becoming problematic. And my expectation as an individual looking at institutions of higher learning, that is where people have to put more effort since that, there, that is where people who work across different industries have been groomed of how to accommodate everyone. So if those kind of institutions themselves have a problem, if persons with disabilities do not have education as equal as other citizens within their countries, that in itself becomes problematic and it does not ensure us anytime sooner we will be able to have a change if um, more effort is not being taken. So now after this journey that has really forced me to start to, to think deep of what can I do since now I had people who were supporting me and the opportunity at least uh, to go to school I, I started my journey uh, as a disability and gender rights advocate. And the inclusion of gender in my work was influenced by the similar challenges that I am highlighting that women are more vulnerable. And looking at right from high schools, uh, taking example um, from the visually impaired community still in the sort of you find that we have only two existing schools and with well established resource centers that can support the visually impaired. Unfortunately, those schools, they are church schools, they have their own policies. And one of those policies is that they don't accommodate mothers or pregnant girls. So it means uh, for many girls with visual impairment, immediately when they become parents or they get pregnant, they are being swept out of the system and there's no other opportunity for them. So I want to affirm and tell you that many have lost the opportunity to go to school and they need it. They still need and we need more support on voicing out these challenges that they are being faced with. 
So now, currently, I work uh, at Lesotho, Vodacom Lesotho Foundation as the coordinator of the Insight Center. So this center, it ensures that it provides uh, information and in accessible formats to all individuals, but particularly focusing on persons with disabilities. So within the center, uh, we, we translate uh, the print materials into braille or digital formats that can be accessible so that the visually impaired populations themselves uh, can be able to have at least an opportunity to learn some of the things, though there's still a barrier that once they are out of the school system, particularly at secondary level and primary, it means there's no other available opportunities. Or even if they are for, for normal or ordinary students, there will be some centers where people can supplement and do their work. But because those centers do not have resource centers or support systems enough, to empower or support uh, persons with visual impairment, it means it is done with them. But the center is trying to mitigate and one of my roles within the center is to advise the foundation on the av available uh, assistive devices that can be provided to persons with disabilities so that they too cannot be left behind. And besides working as the coordinator at the Insight Center, I have also founded and, and I am a secretary general of the Unique Voices Network. This is a platform where we aim to amplify diverse perspectives and we try to empower voices that often are not heard. So within uh, this network, we try to, to create those um, moments where persons with disabilities can share their stories because all the situations are traumatic and sometimes people with disability end up believing that maybe it is the problem or maybe they're not capable enough because uh, some people will try to say, we know a particular individual. Many will say, we know Refilwe and we know um, another one, they were able to go to university and therefore we are providing inclusive education or we are, we are providing those services but then they do not look at the underlying factors of various interlapping social identities that these people are carrying that denies them the opportunity to be studying or to have that similar uh, opportunities as the mainstream. Uh, thank you so much, Damaris. I think um, most of the things, and um, I'll be guided also by the questions as we go through that part. Wonderful. Thank you so very much, Fifi, for that inspiring talk. And thank you, Brian, as well. At this time, I want to open it up for discussion. And I don't want to be the first person to ask a question or comment. I want the audience to engage with our speakers first. And there are some questions here on the chat. I think some of them are comments. I'll start with those, please. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question for our speakers, Brian or Fifi. And in the meantime, I'll check the chat and see uh, some of the comments that are there. Fifi, I'll read this um, to you especially. It's, we have uh, Tebelo Sassini saying, we, oh, oh, no, no. I'm, advo and I'm advocating that all teachers should have modules on special education. It should not be a specialization. It should, it should, or must, must be. And that's, uh, I think, in regard to Brian talking about inclusive education. And Brian, maybe you can talk more about uh, what you think or feel about that comment. And then people with disabilities are very limited. It's not fair. Very true, uh, Tebelo. Brian, please remind me how you ended up on a wheelchair. Brian, do you want to respond to that right now? Um, this is from Tebelo, Sisin. Okay, thank you. Uh, she has she has the same name with Fifi, with yes. the same last name, yeah? Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for your question. Um, how, how I ended up being on a wheelchair is that almost to the date, 10 years ago, I suffered, I was involved in a road accident and suffered a spinal cord injury, 
um, that left me paralyzed from my armpits down. And yeah, that's, that's how I ended up uh, being, being uh, on a wheelchair. And um, uh, so far, there is no treatment for it. And it's more likely, uh, it's more likely uh, to be a life, a lifetime sort of thing, unless there is, there is um, new, there is new something. Someone, someone discovers something new medically. But yeah, that is how I ended up being on a wheelchair. And I would support what you, what you, what you've just said that there needs to be more integration and more inclusive, um, more inclus inclusion in terms of uh, the education system. I feel like. Uh, here, especially here in Kenya, they are really trying, but um, of course we still need to keep on applying the pressure and talking about why it is important for for us to to have a more integrated system rather than us being uh, um, the opposite of integration, which is seg segregation. Segregation, which is not good. Eh? We shouldn't be apart, uh, especially in in schools. So yeah. Thank you so much, Brian. Maybe uh, just to add, maybe it's a question, but you, you've partly responded to it. Growing up, I remember that um, there were schools that were, were exclusively for uh, children, especially with disabilities. And uh, I don't know exactly how the, the situation, the system is right now in Kenya and maybe Lesotho. Uh, are the schools now more integrated in terms of uh, the, the, the attendance? Do all children have, um, not necessarily accessibility is an issue of already you've uh, um, presented on that, but do you think that schools are, are more inviting, not in terms of giving them accessibility of, of students from communities, because growing up in a, in a local community, we, don't, we didn't even have within the community a school for special children with special needs, you had to travel far, I think Thika and Kisumu in those different regions. So given that those uh, institutions are not available within the communities, so the schools that we have within the communities are more open to accepting uh, students with uh, living with disabilities of different types. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for your question, Damaris. I think the schools now are more are more inviting of children of children with uh, special needs or children with disabilities. I think the the issue comes with uh, the society around, maybe okay. the villages or maybe in the in the towns. Maybe that is where the the backward mentality still is that uh, people. Um, the children are still um, are discriminated against. And they, like Fifi said, the same case is in Kenya that disability is still seen as something like a curse in some areas. So uh, parents would rather just hide their children away and not subject themselves or the, the, the children to that kind of victimization. So I would say um, the, the, the government and the schools in extension are, are trying to do something good. And they, in the beginning, they are, they're just beginning to do that. And of course, as, as we move on, it's going to have much more uh, impact. But of course, the start is always rocky, but uh, the intention is good. Uh, we just need to, to get over and to get beyond all these other things that are, are hindering the children from going back to school. Thank you so much, Brian. So I'll read one more question on the chat. I think it was before uh, Kinua, you raised your hand and still it's the table and this goes to, in, in regard to Fifi's uh, presentation, I believe schools in all levels of education and stroke systems should be a hope giving environment uh, for all children with with or without disabilities, schools should be with should be where all children struck student needs should be met. So, so Fifi uh, Tebelo, if I'm right, it's uh, in regard to the comment that Fifi made that higher education institutions should especially be more accommodative or be more welcoming environments for 
people living with disabilities, if I'm not wrong. You can correct me. Please feel free, Tebelo, to uh, ask or comment verbally. But Fifi, I perhaps think uh, that comment is in regard to your talk. Do you have anything to say about all education institutions should be not just higher education institutions? Oh, yes, I totally agree because as I have highlighted, the challenge starts right from primary schools. And if um, now I, I talked even in the case of the visually impaired, Lesotho uh, practices inclusive education. Uh, they have inclusive policy and they are in support of that, though there are still few um, special schools. But you find that if a caution or support if it is not taken seriously, even at primary even at a early childhood a education level, there's, there will still be a problem. And inclusive education itself is very problematic looking at the policies and looking at what is on, on the ground level, what is happening. There's a totally um, big gap that needs to be addressed. Because if we are saying um, we are practicing inclusive education, but we find a child with disability having to depend on another student to read for them. That means that the system itself is not answering to the educational needs of this child. So very true, all, all systems or all education levels have to, 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 to see that they do this differently and be more intentional while trying to accommodate persons with disabilities. Thank you so much, Fifi. So I have, I see Kinu. I, perhaps I'm pronouncing your name wrong, but Kinu, please, you can unmute yourself and ask the question or make a comment. Oh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Kinu. Kinu. Thank Kine you. Uwe. Kine Uwe. We Kine can do better than that. <laughs> Kinu. Yeah, Kine Uwe. Kine Uwe. That's better. Oh. Yeah, I'm from the beautiful mountain kingdom of Lesotho. I don't really have a question per se. I just have comments and mm -hmm. would like to say thank you to the two presenters. I'm not turning on my video. What what we suppose, guys? I'm visually impaired, so I don't know where to click. <laughs> but yeah, oh. I do have comments for Brian. Thank you so much, Brian, for sharing your story and the work that you are doing in Kenya to impact lives. Um, you also said something very profound about inclusion, inclusion of persons with disabilities. Uh, that is meaningful engagement of people with disabilities in development issues. I, I think that is very important because most of the time we confuse meaningful inclusion with tokenism, like which you refer to as just ticking the boxes, the number of people that we have with disabilities, the number of women, and 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 and. And I think it's time that really we have people like you, Brian, who are able to speak up and advocate for meaningful engagement and stop with the superficial inclusion tactics that involves uh, service level efforts, not genuine commitment to inclusion of people with disabilities in development issues. Uh, for Fifi. Uh, also, thank you so much for sharing your story and for inviting us, Fifi, for uh, to this meeting. It was really insightful to get to know what other people are doing in different countries. Maybe you know Fifi's work in Lesotho, but it was really insightful to get to know what Brian is doing in 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 Kenya. I learned uh, a lot uh, in this meeting, Fifi. From your story, I learned that women with disabilities are more disadvantaged. Uh, I wish we can have more projects that are aimed exploring and exploring a situation like this where gender and disabilities as two aspects of an individual's identity intersect and uh, expose them to multiple layers of stigma and discrimination. Today we hear of Fifi's story and the question may be, how many are suffering out there without their stories being told? We need to be intentional about addressing gender and disability component inequalities. That's just my what for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you can allow me to call you K for now, I promise I'll practice saying your name correctly. Thank you so much for those very nice comments and for joining us here and for supporting Fifi. We totally um, communicate. 
need to call me Kay. <laughs> thank you so much for allowing me to call you Kay. So, uh, anyone in the audience that has a, something to say before I read what I have in the comments, please feel free to unmute. Oh, my. There is another K, Colo Fellow. Please go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank both the speakers. Um, I really learned a lot. It was very insightful information. Um, I must say I had the pleasure of meeting Fifi in 2003. And she was my roommate. So I had the pleasure of being her assistant. Um, and I've learned a lot from her because as someone with with um, not living with a disability and having not been exposed to anyone from family, from friends with a disability and having to, um, and I really had to, I can't say adjust, but like it was an amazing opportunity for, for Fifi and I. And at some point, um, Fifi had to be my assistant because <laughs> we we actually swapped roles. So it was an amazing thing to give someone an opportunity because just because someone is visually impaired does not mean they are not capable. So sometimes we'd swap roles. So I used to close my eyes and Fifi had to be my guide. And we've done it so well so yeah it was amazing and yeah we used to look at ourselves in the mirror so I really learned a lot and now that has made me more aware of the spaces because normally when we speak about disability we are always looking at um, people who are either paraplegic so we normally we often people of um the visually impaired and the hearing impaired are normally left out. So it's it was just an amazing thing and an eye-opening experience just meeting people with dis different disabilities because it it just makes one like um it just reminds us of being aware of spaces in which we are. So how we present, for example, um platforms like Zoom and our teams where people, some people might not hear what's being said in the meeting and some people might not see what has what is being presented. So it's very much an experience to just for us who are probably um, able or differently abled to, to just be aware of how we present and also accommodating everyone and without even knowing that there's someone in the room who's visually impaired, but it's just having those available at all times and not just waiting to have someone with who is differently abled and might need um, some sort of, because also in South Africa, South Africa has a lot of advanced things and we are so much into technology and stuff, but a lot of times uh, people with um, disabilities are often left out. So it's, it, the things are evolving, but um, in most cases, accessibility to resources and facilities, they still don't cater for people with disabilities. But I must say, I've learned a lot and I'm so glad. This is my first time. Fifi also shared the link and I decided to join the tea and I'm hoping to um, join more teas <laughs> because this was an amazing experience. And thank you so much to MSU for this amazing platform. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colo Fellow. You have to excuse me. I know I might not be pronouncing it right, but th those are really very powerful comments and for you being a true friend, not just a friend who is, with, but a friend who shows up uh, when you're invited. And we're happy to have you here on this platform and we look forward to having you join us for more. Thank you so much again. for Thank this. you. Thank you so much. I'm by the way, I'm not just a friend. So Fifi and I actually realized we were born two days apart. Um so we learned twins? that. So we 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 call each other twins. <laughs> that sounds like twins to me. Thank you. That's Thank you. Amazing. Thank and you. Please, as you said, welcome back again. This is held by weekly. We'll share more information about that.
I don't see a hand again. I will read here. It's from Doreen Mkuto. My name is Doreen Mkuto, a social worker from South Africa, currently residing in Free State Province. My hometown is Letter Bile in Brits or Pretoria, to have a clear picture. Thank you, Fifi, for the invite to this amazing networking. I regard myself as an a dis, uh, as disability advocate. I met FIF in 2023 20, during our contact classes as gender studies owners at University of Free State, an amazing soul. Those are comments from Doreen Fifi. Fifi, is Fifi here? Hmm. I'm still here. I'm still He's here. There. Oh, there. can you hear the me reading the comments? Oh yes, I can oh. hear you perfectly. That's and wonderful. That's your friend Doreen. Oh yes, oh yes. And thank you to everyone who, who has come in. Um <laughs> my people, thank you so much. And I'm happy that my work it is not it has been recognized and I'm able to to make individuals wherever I go to have a deeper understanding of the challenges that we are facing because our work in disability advocacy is not an individual work, but is our collective work and we need each other with or without disability so that we can make a world that is more inclusive and ensures that nobody is being left behind because of that difference in society. Very well articulated, uh, Fifi. Greetings. This is from Lori Penfold. Greetings from Lansing, Michigan, and Peckham. It's wonderful to hear from you, Brian and Fifi. That's for you, Brian and Fifi. Thank you, Lori, for joining us for this presentation. And then Francis uh, Ichuki from Kenya says, thank you both for resilience. Tebelo, uh, yes, madam, schools accommodate them, but it's a touch. Oh, this was uh, my question. Thank you, Tebelo, for commenting. Yes, madam, schools accommodate them, but it's a touch as they do not have suitable structure, learning and teaching tools. I'm pro a professional high school teacher. I speak from that lens. So thank you so much for yeah, elaborating on that. In Lesotho, we have a limited number of such children. All right. Uh, okay. Gishuki here, Francis, is saying, has Brian and Fifi explored the role of sports in advocacy? It's powerful. It's a powerful strategy that can bring on board stakeholders to experience the life of a person with disability. What I believe it's what a, a person with disability goes through. Do you want to, starting with Brian, do you want to respond to that? Have you explored the role of sports in advocacy? Um, yeah, I, I was actually introduced to uh, an organization that offers cycling services and opportunities specifically for people who have disabilities. And I'm not the most sporty person, so <laughs> that that maybe is not my forte, but I do, I have seen it and I have seen the power of, that sport has. And maybe now that you mention it, maybe it should be something that maybe I should look into, even if I'm not. Uh, it's not a, a strong, a strong suit for uh, uh, a strength of mine. But I do recognize that true sports uh, uh, sports is an activity that that brings a lot of people together and people exchange ideas. And yeah, thank you for for that recommendation. And yeah, thanks. Thank you, Brian. Fifi, do you have something to say in terms of uh, the role of sports in advocacy? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, within my work so far, I have not incorporated a sport, but I have been working closely with Kay, and um, she's also a disability uh, advocate. And for now, what has been advocated for in Lesotho is that uh, through her work and support of many others, is that we try to ensure that there is also a blind football in Lesotho. But what I would like to highlight, in as much as there is that power in sports that we can also use, 
it has always been a disadvantage when it comes to how persons with disabilities participate in sports in Lesotho. Uh, normally, or what is most common is those who are athletes, uh, that, that, that it is the sector or part of sports that they find themselves mostly engaged in. But one thing I have also learned while I was in Michigan, I, I interacted with people from Pegam and thank you, Lori, for joining us in. And she's one of um, ladies who have inspired me, who's also visually impaired. And um, this year I have enrolled to start the swimming lessons and I wanted to do it and see how it goes so that we can also incorporate it within my work and trying to also include it within schools because now it needs somebody who says, I have done it, we have this so that um, we can be able to motivate because when you just speak from a lens that we need this, they'll say there are no resources, we cannot do it. So we are just trying to figure out strategies or sports in that um, can be much easily implemented. And we need support also on that one. Thank you, Sisi. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I will, uh, Kay, do you still have your hand up? Okay. Yes, please. Oh, you have something? Yeah, I have a question to uh, Brian. Brian, yeah, Brian, right? Okay, give me a moment then. Elio, did I see your hand up or you lowered it? No? Yeah, yes, I lowered it, but I, I could give my comment if there is a chance. Sure, please. Okay, let's have Elio. I saw his hand up first and then we'll come back to you. Thank okay, you. Okay, no problem. All right. Yeah, uh, okay, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Elliot from Kenya. I just want to applaud uh, Fifi and Brian for the amazing work they do, they're doing. Um, that's very commendable. And um, a lot of uh, learnings from that. And also a lot of, uh, you know, uh, I liked uh, Brian's um, uh, resolve, um, especially when the comments like when he, he talked about comments like shattered dreams and uh, you know like life is uh, is, is going to be different difficult but he was able to overcome that that is very very encouraging um perhaps sometimes it would be good to 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 look at the flip side um from my interactions with the people uh who are able differently uh, a term that is increasingly being used so much. Um, well, I realize that we are all disabled. So if you are to, there's no definition of dis disabled, I mean, being disabled. And basically what we all need to know is that if uh, there's a term called disabled, then we are all disabled in a way. It's just that um, a majority of us uh, tend to um, frame it in, in a certain manner. And this happened because um, I developed interest in, 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 in learning sign language. And the school I joined um, had people with different abilities, including those with visual impairment and um, physical and even mental, uh, you know, even uh, the, the, the ones who learn slowly. They were all a, a very wide spectrum. So one of the, my friends who is now pursuing a law degree and has visual impairment, uh, said that when he found himself to be that way, he asked himself, how about if everyone else in the world was, was born with visual impairment and perhaps only two people had uh, no problem with visual um, you know, ability? So who would be, who would be the, the disabled person here? then that really changed the, my perspective of being called a, 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 a person with a disability because it, it could be the other way. It, it could be who me who thinks I'm not um, disabled. I could be the one who is disabled and the other person I think is disabled is, is actually very normal. So I think um, um, as humanity, we just need to uh, I think you know like wider and 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 embrace uh, uh, the the work Brian and Fifi are doing, so that we can support everyone else to understand and and, and to de to be demystify the word disability, and and that will bring a lot of inclusion rather than 
um, uh, the, the the discrimination that we we have been seeing, and especially in the African context, which is also supported by uh, uh, bad cultures. Uh, for example, a culture that says um, uh, a disability is you know a curse and something like that. So that would be my comment, and thank you for the amazing job, Brian and Fifi. Thank you, Eliud, for that comment. Uh, Brian, do you have something to say in regard to Eliud's comment or we're good? Good, okay. Then, uh, who was that? It was Kay. Kay, uh, you'll have the opportunity and then we have Doreen and then, yeah, you are, and then Doreen, please, Kay. Oh, okay. Okay, my question is directed to Brian. Brian, I want to know how effective are the existing legislation and policies mm. in promoting disability inclusion in Kenya? I know in my country, the beautiful country, Mountain Kingdom of Lesotho, which is not as beautiful when it comes to policy and law uh, implementation. <laughs> Things are not really good. We had beautiful policies, but implementation is quite a bit of a challenge. I want to know how is the situation like in Kenya. Also, I want to know how is the gender gap like in as far as access to opportunities is concerned in your country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, I think the the situation with um, uh, with the legislation. I think it's it's a matter of we are not where we were but we are not where we want to be. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is the, that is the issue with, uh, that, is a, that is a reality with most African countries. And um, I, as we were preparing for this, for this presentation, I was doing some research on the, the, our, our idea of the Disability Act here in Kenya. And it was passed, it was put on paper in 2003, but it was only, it was made to it was put up it was made as a part of of constitution about seven years later and implementation has been slow i guess it depends on who you ask uh, some people might have felt like uh, maybe there is no change other people might might feel like we have made some progress but if you're asking me i would say that we we as a country are trying and we are trying, but I feel like we need to try harder in terms of implementation. And that is why advocacy is so important because advo what advocacy does is that we keep on pushing the buttons and making sure that the case doesn't go cold, that uh, every, the things are, st are always in motion. So so that, yeah, I feel like that that is what I would say in terms of the gap uh, for for men and women uh, 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 we we are a, a fast developing country, and I would say the same. We we have we have made major strides uh, in terms of e equity and equality, but of course we we are still a, a long way from where we need to be. But um, yeah, so far I feel like we are on the right path. I wouldn't want to to bash our beautiful country too much. Uh, I am sure Damaris would agree that uh, things are not so badly off. <laughs> of course, I will say things are not the same, but the work that you're doing, perhaps the advocacy work actually, and work of uh, some NGOs is, is making the biggest difference. Somebody was presenting today um, at the Hour in Africa. We had a presenter there. I think she was supposed to be here, but uh, I don't see her. And she was talking about um, how there's a feeling that government should do more because the NGOs, of course, private and public sectors, it's a good thing when they work together. But the, 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 the sentiment was the government is kind of leaving majority of the work to NGOs. And, you know, the NGOs mostly financially are supported by um, limited sources of funding. So when that funding is gone, we go back to square zero. So basically to say we need to be pushing more. Thank you for the work you're doing, Brian and Fifi. We, we, that's why I really so much as, an, as a person appreciate the work that you do and admire 
how you've uh, I, I I want to I wrote it down somewhere, Brian, where you said that um it's not um uh, I'm paraphrasing kind of I don't think I got we have no control over what happens to us, but we have control on how to respond to whatever situation that is. So I love the way that you've uh, responded to 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 the challenging situations, of course, that uh, you've uh, experienced. And I, I believe the advocacy work that you do is what is making a, the, the biggest difference even in Kenya. I'm not... Um, <laughs> Uh, throwing anybody under the bus. I know we, we love our country, but the truth is uh, the individual work that happens in communities is what is making the biggest difference. That's why I feel like we should have people like you more talk about work that is being done that might not be having space to be highlighted. And, and this is a place where you can have people to collaborate with, to mentor you more, you know. So I'll, I'll stop there and give this chance to Doreen. Doreen, please. Amaris, Amaris, please. Oh, you are, your hand was yeah. first. I'm sorry then. Tell yeah, me. I'm sorry. Uh, my data is depleting very fast. Oh, I ahead. might leave you anytime soon. So I'm sorry. I have, I've caught some flu. So I was saying I'm oh. a teacher by profession, high school mm -hmm. teacher, but I have experience in teaching primary and high school as well. Mm -hmm. So um, a teacher can be everything, right? I can also become an, an advocate. So please, um, I want to join you. Tell me how I should be part of you. That's my main concern. I'm a All teacher right. and I'm very touched by this, uh, this session today. All right, thank you so much, Tebelo. Yes, of course, we've seen your comments, a lot of comments and very in, uh, impactful, influential comments on the chat. Uh, we at Michigan State University, at the African Studies Center specifically, are open to working with you, talking more about how we can, you know, uh, have- I have a... left my, my contact details on the chat box. Yes, I'll Please reach, do reach out and thank you, Fifi. That's my sister for inviting me to this informative session. I have learned a lot and I thank everyone <clears throat> for your time and for this information. It has impacted me a lot. I think I am I am an informed teacher now in the discipline of disability. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tebelo. And we have Brian, Fifi, and everybody here. I know there are many people here that uh, we can work with together. So we'll reach out, of course, definitely. Thank you for sharing your contact information with us. I'll be very glad. And I think it's needful. I need to be like to be part of you and to know this information and to cry for those who cannot cry, to push, to reach. To, to open up, to speak for all these people and for all these children. I believe in, in, in inclusivity. Thank you. Thank you. And you have a platform as a teacher, Tebelo. Thank you for opening up your space and time to be part of the advocacy work that uh, should actually be part of what we do every day. So Doreen, please. Good evening, uh, Damaris. Thank you so much. An amazing host. Uh, thank you so much um, to Brian and Fifi for their wonderful presentation. Indeed, I'll concur with the previous uh, speakers to say this has just revived the passion that one has to working with persons with disabilities. Having said that, I wanted to check with, because I'm in South Africa and I'll be speaking from the context of South Africa, but I wanted to check with Brian and Fifi that um, do they have uh, what in South Africa we call protective workshops. So what protective workshops are, it's um, I would say an NPC, nonprofit companies, which um, cater and cares for persons with disabilities uh, who cannot work into a open labor market. I had a privilege of being a social worker in one of the 
nonprofit organizations and at some point being appointed as a marketer because of the passion that the CEO identified in me to care for over 25 protective workshops. So what happens is that um, we liaise with special schools around Pretoria, where I was based previously before I came to Bloemfontein. So would liaise with, as Fifi was, was narrating to say, the challenges from primary school and the challenges from high school as well as tertiary. But the experience that I had was with um, learners from primary school as well as when they depart from their high school. Where do they go? Because they cannot work into your retail. They cannot work into your corporate world but they still need a purpose, isn't it? So what protective workshops um, uh, do function as, it's they will get suppliers, for example, they will talk with Vodacom or they will talk with your steel companies that make your, I'm not sure whether we are all familiar with your gutters, you know, there is the, the still things that hold your pipe that uh, sub supply water, you know, your rainwater there at your roof. There is this, I don't know how to explain it, but I think maybe some would be able to explain it better than I do. So our learners or our persons with disabilities, they would come and do such work. The place, it's conducive for them. There is no pressure. They have various disabilities, whether physical, intellectual. Um, unfortunately, where I was working, the, we did not have visually impaired. But because I was the market and I was a social worker, I was able to liaise with other centers that had visually impaired or speech impairment and all that. So I wanted to check in the context of Kenya as well as the studio, do Fifi and, and Brian maybe have been exposed to to such opportunities for persons with disabilities maybe at their countries. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen, for that question and for the nice comments. Thanks. And Fifi, do you want to respond first? Oh, thank you so much, Damaris. Um, thank you so much, Doreen. Um, if I, I understood well, um, is whether we have been exposed to opportunities where learners with um, disabilities are able to do some of the work that empowerment do that do empower them. Did I get uh, it well? Yes, yes, Pepe. It's it's okay. for for the who cannot work, work into an open labor market, you know, so maybe create some centers where maybe we can come up with ways to just bring work to them and so that they can also, you know, earn a living and all that. Well, um, in Lesotho, the situation is like there are some uh, disabled persons organizations uh, you'll see that they still try to do some of advocacy at some point, and they still try to extend uh, by providing some of the projects. But you'll find that the major challenge is that some of the activities or projects that are being developed, they are not very beneficial in some cases. Uh, I can make an example. you find that some of the projects that uh, persons will be told to do is to to make candles and looking at now Lesotho is starting to use more of electricity only a few houses and those houses are within the rural areas that strongly need um use of candles it means they continue to make candles they cannot make any money or any 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 source of income from that and you'll find that um, in other different uh, disabilities, they'll do some projects within those centers or organizations. Sometimes they will be making work related to carpentry and stuff, but you'll find that the challenge is how do they become competitive so that 
the opportunities that are there can help them be sustainable. You see that they get that opportunities, particularly when they are within the rehabilitation centers. And the moment they go out of the rehabilitation centers, it is a struggle of how do they how do they make use of whatever that they were taught within that context and make it into a reality? Thank you, uh, Fifi. Uh, Brian? Uh, we don't have um, like a name for it here in Kenya, but like you said in South Africa, uh, we don't have workshops here in Kenya, but we do have nonprofits that um, try to to offer um, skills to people who are experiencing disability and they give them an opportunity to to do something with their hands something with what they have and uh, they are able to maybe earn a living uh, maybe to feed their families and something like that but uh, it's not something that i don't feel it, it's uh, maybe in some areas i've not had uh, personal experience with it but from what i see it's not something that is um, is maybe has has gone it has 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 been able to to reach uh, every 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 part of the country just specific areas uh, specifically the more um, the more impoverished areas that is where the nonprofits tend to to go so there is there is indeed that kind of arrangement here but i've not personally i've not um, experienced it wonderful that was a great question it kept you thinking and uh, salah i see your hand up please Hi, Fifi and Brian. It's so nice to hear your voices. And I wanted to let you know that Anjam and Derek and Melissa are also on. And so, um, you know, we're preparing for um, the Mandela Washington Fellowship in 2024. There might be an occasion for us to bring you back to do something similar online, remotely. Sadly, we can't bring you here, but it would be wonderful to do that. Maybe sometime we'll see you again soon here in Michigan. I wanted to ask you after your return, what was your um, what was your reception like in your community, both from your families and from your uh, your uh, the people you work with? Uh, what kind of um, what kind of conversations did you have with them about your time in the United States? Both of you spent six weeks at Michigan State, and then you went and spent another month in. Fifi was in Austin and you were in Minneapolis, Brian. What what kind of what kind of a, a reception did you get from people? And do you feel like um the the experience that you brought back, um, people recognize um the importance of the work you're doing? Brian. It's oh thank you again, Damaris, for doing this. I'm so grateful to you for making this happen. You're welcome. And thank you. For those who don't know, Salah was the lead in the Mandela Washington uh, Fellowship Program. We worked together and mentioned Derek here. We have Anjam. I think I saw somebody else, maybe not, but Melissa. Were, Melissa, uh, Melissa. Melissa is here. Still, actually, Melissa is still here. Yeah. We were all part of that team. And, and it, I mean, just to say that Brian and Fifi and the rest of the team were just wonderful young people is understatement so brian please yeah thank you so much salai it's so nice to to see you and hear from you uh me uh a lot of greetings to melissa uh derek and anjam anjam i hope you are proud of my uh, presentation skills i was thinking about you when i was preparing that slide <laughs> you taught us a lot about it. Yeah, so. I'm very proud of you. It was great. And I sent you a private message telling you that I'm very proud of you. Thank you so much. Um, so back to your question, Salah. Um, I think um, people, people are aware of the work that I was doing before I left. But I guess with with me being selected for the fellowship, maybe it gave me, I don't know if I would say it, credibility. So mm -hmm. people uh, more uh, took me more seriously after I came back. 
and uh, I had a lot of conversations with even uh, people who I didn't think I would have conversations with and they wanted to know uh, what did you learn, what, what, how can we work together and, and what opportunities are there for collaborating. So um, I would say it has been, it has been um, on both sides because on the, on the flip side, um, there's so much expectation because um, when you go to the US and you spend as much time as we did, uh, people, people have a lot of expectations of you and from you when you come back and they are constantly waiting for you to do something big and something massive so that uh, you can, it, it, can make, it can make sense to them that you went, you went to the States, you came back here, where is all the money, where, is all, where are all the donations, you know? So because that is what people expect. So uh, I would say it has been on both sides, but um, all in all, I think the greatest, the greatest thing for me has been how much my mind has changed and how differently I see the world right now. Uh, based on my experiences uh, during the summer, and I feel like moving forward, um, I would, I, I think I, right now I'm thinking about advocacy in a very different way. I'm thinking about uh, elevating and empowering the lives of the community of the disability community in very different ways. So, uh, I think for me that has been that is going to be the most precious thing just me being able to share what I saw, what I had with people, with my community, and hopefully I'm going to, to change their minds, to change their minds as well. So thank you for that question. And it's so, so nice to hear from you again. Salah. Please, please pass, pass along greetings to Steve for me and uh, wish you well in your family. We'll talk soon. All right. I want to assume that Steve is your dad, Brian. Yes, yes, Steve is my dad. <laughs> Great, thank you. Before I read the closing comments, we have about seven minutes to close. I'll give this time to Fifi, please, to respond to Salah's question, maybe comment, actually. Thank you so much, Mr. Oh my, I'm so happy. Um, Salah to hear from you and all the MSU team. Well, coming back to the beautiful mountain kingdom of Lesotho, it was something very different before I went to the US. Uh, while I was going for the fellowship, first I was not working. I was still pushing most of my advocacy work as an individual and at the same time studying. And as soon as I came back, I had the opportunity to be called on to take that position of the coordinator within the Insight Center. And mm -hmm. uh, within the center, uh, most of the responsibilities that I do, they are the result of the experience I received from Michigan as well, in, as, well as in Texas at the Lighthouse for the Blind, because there I was being trained on different assistive technologies and available softwares for the visually impaired and the deaf blind. So it, it gave me exposure at the same time, recognition. And coming back, I was also able to register the beautiful network. I have just registered it. And before I went to the US, it was still something that has not manifested though I was already continuing with my work at crown level. So the opportunity to go to the U.S. itself uh, made people to, to support me more. And at the same time, the training I received, the exposure I got, it helped me to, to, to be more able to talk more about my work and not suppress even some of the challenges. Now, most of the approaches that I take instead of being frustrated is to use different strategies I learned and come up with tangible solutions of how I can help different people to start to be more inclusive and accommodative to persons with disabilities. Well, thank you to you too, Fifi. So um, we have about five minutes now. I will see what we have here on the chat quickly. 
um oh my what am i even doing okay so uh doreen gave us her phone number before we do doreen uh what did i see edith there was a student so edith is one of our graduate students here but i think she left and she said, thank you, Brian and Fifi, for sharing your inspirational stories. All the best with your life and work goals. Uh, looking forward to seeing more of your work in more diverse spaces. We'll pass the thank you for the nice comment to her. I think she left. And then uh, we have uh, uh, Leo Zuru, that's uh, the interim director here at the African Studies Center. He says, thank you for a very touching and powerful presentation on such an important but all too often neglected mm -hmm. topic and section of our population. Thanks, uh, Professor Zulu, for that wonderful comment. Uh, and then we have Doreen. To Dama. Yes. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to, I have my, my, I raised my hand. I just wanted to um, also thank you for putting this together and to Brian and Fifi to come and, and be vulnerable in front of all of us and sharing your disability, your vulnerability. Um, and the fact that you're doing this at a very late time at mm -hmm. your end um, to accommodate our agendas, I, I feel very privileged to have been able to sit for this to these two presentations um, because I, I know that the effort that it takes you, it took you to prepare all this and also uh, the time that you're offering us because it's very late at your end. It is. Thank you, Anjama. I say that to all our tea time presenters. And you can imagine, we used to hold this 4 to, to 6 p.m. But because of COVID and because we had to have hybrid or virtual um, format for, for uh, forum now, we we decided to move an hour back. So you can imagine still it's, it's, it's late but they have to accommodate us in our programming here. So I always say thank you so very much for your time and for the sacrifice that you make or you've made you to, to be here to facilitate this talk or to speak to us. So I want to do just one final comment before we give this opportunity to Brian and, and Fifi to give us any closing uh, remarks. And then we have to Damaris and Tim here is with, oh, this is Doreen sharing her phone number with us. And she says, I feel really empowered and open to engage further on how one can be empowered to advocate better for persons with disability. Thank you, because a forum like, this is what this type of forum is supposed to do, extend networks, um, build collaborations. So thank you, nice meeting you, Doreen, and we'll engage more. We'll talk more, at least now we have contact information of everybody that was in this call. We'll continue the discussion outside here. It's the tea time. So where is the tea? Oh my. And uh, who is this? K. We usually have tea. It's only that um, since we started having the hybrid uh, session, you can have your tea. Actually, sometimes we have our teas in a cup. We used to have, especially now it's Kenya and um, Lesotho are represented. We could have a snack from Kenya. We provide tea. And then we have mandazi from Kenya. And then we can have our favorite um snack from Lesotho. So it used to be like that. We Slowly we'll go back, but I think even if we went back, it will be hybrid. So then we can have people like Brian and Fifi still join the discussions. Like now we have Gichuki and Eliud. They're joining from Kenya as well. And they've, they're here all the time. Since they learned about the African Tea Time, they've presented here. They've been part of the discussion. So we thank our audience so much. I think I will read the very last comment. Please share these types of forums. I would share with the DEI practitioners around campus. Oh, Anjam, thank you. We'll perhaps include you in our mailing list in case we forget to share it personally with you. But thank you so much for joining us today. So it's five. Brian, one second, two seconds comment, closing remarks. Oh, you're, you're muted, Brian. Yeah. Thank you so much, Damaris, for the opportunity. I must say, as I was preparing for this uh, presentation, I was doing a lot of research and soul searching, 
and uh, it rejuvenated my passion for for the work that I do and I was very very I was looking forward to to sharing my work with you and I hope I've been able to do that in a, in an effective way and uh, being here around uh, my people from MSU has uh, has just made me uh, I think about you so much miss you so much and I want you to know that you had a lot of impact in my life and I wish you all, all the best and I hope to be to to be involved like Salah said uh, mm -hmm. once once the the fellows come and Melissa I miss you so much and I hope you are doing okay you too Derek thank you so much oh that's wonderful Melissa did you want to say something I just I just want to say um it is such a pleasure to, to see you both, um, to, to hear you both, um, just so extremely proud of who you are and who you've become and um, how you use this experience um, here at MSU to take back home and be more of the greatness that you already are. Wow. Thank you, Melissa. You were with them for the whole six weeks. So yes, those memories come back. Yes, they're very precious to me. <laughs> they are. They are. Yeah. I, I agree yeah. with you. Fifi, please. Just Thank closing you. short. Okay. Thank you so much. They, I really appreciate uh, being invited to come and share my story. Personally, what I would say is I would not be where I am if it wasn't for the support I received from my people in Lesotho, in South Africa, everywhere around the world, and in particular in MSU and also Texas, I would have not been able to be in a position where I am. And with that said, it is the highlight that everything that we do, being intentional and extending the helping hand to somebody with disability, you are not just changing that particular uh, person's life, but you have changed multiple lives. And I really appreciate and looking forward for all the collaborations and support and power and, and empowerment that um, we would receive even in our work because being an advocate, advocating for the life that you're already experiencing, at some point there are some traumas and challenges and we always need support to continue and have the strength and passion always for all to continue with our work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fifi. I, sometimes I don't know how to stop, but we have to stop because uh, this has been really wonderful having you, Brian, and... Um, Fifi here, I knew you were going to come back. And we say once a Spartan, always one. You are our alumni. So we'll be working with you. We'll be engaging with you and the rest of the team, our alumni team, the Mandela Washington uh, fellows alums. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to, to bring, I mean, at the end of the day, we'll have everybody back to share more about their work because that's why we have this platform, is to be able to have uh, discussions that otherwise Perhaps, especially you came to MSU, but not everybody at MSU had a chance to interact with you, had a chance to know the work that you do. Since we have this platform, one by one, as um, uh, opportunity comes, we'll be incorporating our alumni because we do that all the time anyway. We invite our students, our alums of different categories to come and speak uh, in this forum. So be sure that you're going to be engaging with us in one way or another. At this point, I really want to say thank you so much for everybody that stayed until the end, joined us, stayed until the end. We, we will look forward to engaging more in this conversation and many more. This is being recorded. It's going to be shared on our social on YouTube um, uh, channel, the African Studies Center, Michigan State University in a couple of days. But I'll share again with you. So in case you had a friend who was not able to be here because especially time of time, they'll be able to have an opportunity to view it. But thank you so much and have a good night for those who are going to sleep. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank bye you. Bye. 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 Bye, bye. bye everyone. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye, bye. bye everyone. Bye.